right, well, it's one after. I guess we should get started. We have more than 300 participants. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Earth Day, Earthlings. I'm Tierra Curry, a senior scientist based in the Center for Biological Diversity's Portland office, but I'm home now, like many of you. And today's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So artist Maybell Equi created this awesome Earth Day poster for us that features monarch butterflies, polar bears, bison, jaguars, a salamander, and a freshwater mussel. I'm very excited about that. And you can share that from the center's social media channels. So today and every day, we're thinking about how can we end the extinction crisis and keep the planet livable for us and for future generations. Back in January, we put out our Saving Life on Earth policy plan calling for an end to the extinction crisis. And one of the asks in that is that the U.S. protect 30% of U.S. lands and waters by 2030 and half by 2050. So why half the earth? Well, it's a big idea. It's something that people can wrap their heads around. It's inspirational and it's also digestible. It's an idea that can unite all of the conservation movements. And if we protect at least half the earth for wildlife, then we can end the extinction crisis and keep earth livable for humans. So a couple of technical things. We've disabled the chat bar because it can be really distracting and some people didn't like that. So we turned that off. At the end, we're gonna have a question and answer section. So type in your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can today. And if we don't get to all of them, then you can email me your unanswered questions or tomorrow I'll be on Slack, the center Slack channel, the under mobilized for the wild, the endangered species channel. So I'll be on there from noon to one Pacific if you wanna email me or chat with me tomorrow about the things we talk about today. And at the end of this, we're gonna um, put out an action alert where you can contact your members of Congress and ask them to protect 30% of the U.S. by 2030. So that'll be on our website, on our Slack channel, and in our Endangered Earth Online newsletter that goes out tomorrow, how you can get involved to help. So with that, our panelists today are Randy Spivak, she is our Public Lands Director, and Kieran Suckling, our Executive Director. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Kieran. Kieran, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, well, it's a strange Earth Day with us all being homebound. But, but you know, maybe that's a good thing because um, Earth Day over the last 50 years has, in some ways, you know, I, I think been a victim of its own success. You know, it's become a, a massive institution it's become a habitual uh, ceremony that we do every year. And I think that has caused us to really not reflect as much as we could on what Earth Day means, what Earth Day should mean. In fact, if you look back to the very, very early days um, when Earth Day first started in the 1970s, it was a much more political, activist-oriented event. It explicitly was thought about and designed to bring about social, political change. And it was an all-volunteer effort. Very little money was spent on it. Um, as it's developed now, and it's put on all over the country. It's got more and more sponsorships. It's become much more of a corporate funded event, a government funded event. And consequently, it's really lost its political edge and, and a lot of what Earth Day focus on around the country are things like recycling and driving less and so forth. And, and the message from all that is that it's you, the citizen, or really you, the consumer, that is driving the problem. And the change that needs to happen is change in your consumption patterns, uh, consequently recycling and so forth. Um, and so what goes with that though, it's not untrue that our consumption patterns are are uh, really important, something we have to pay attention to, but it shifted the blame for what's destroying the earth to individuals, to consumers. Uh, but it turns out that soccer moms are not 
killing the planet. Exxon is killing the planet. And while it's good to recycle, certainly, it's better to ensure we have a president who's not undermining all our uh, environmental gains, because uh, that's where the action really is. And when we first discovered that lead was a very, very serious pollutant, the response wasn't, oh, consumers, why don't you consume less? What's wrong with you consumers? You're, you're buying lead paint, you're buying lead gas, you need to stop that consumers. No, we just banned lead as a political action. We took a systematic approach to it and saw that this should not even be an option for consumers. It needs to be politically and systematically taken off uh, the plate. So here we are, <laughs> most of us not consuming so much these days, uh, we're at home. And I think it's a really good time to think about, well, what, what really can save the earth? What really can stop the extinction crisis? What, what do we really need to do to stop runaway climate change? Um, and, and I think when you really think about that, when you stop, you realize yeah, it's, it's deep systematic change. And that's where our efforts should primarily focus as we get our own houses in order of course, and I think that also, you know, we've been drifting for a while. We're making a lot of good environmental gains um, on all kinds of different fronts. Our water is cleaner than it used to be. Our air is cleaner than it used to be. Endangered species, um, the ones that are protected at least, are improving in population trends. Uh, there's a lot of good trends out there, but I really think now is a time for us that we've stopped here to think, okay, we need to go to a new higher level. We need to go beyond the in incremental gains we've been making. We need to act in a mass social movement to stop the extinction crisis. Uh, really get out of business as usual, get out of our smaller visions and everyday work to demand something dramatically big, dramatically new. And what that is, um, is that the United States and indeed all countries on earth should protect 50% of their lands, their waters, the oceans they control. They should protect 50% of the planet. So, are you, I can't tell if you're frozen or if that was the end of what you want to say about Earth Day. Um, so, if I look frozen, can you hear me? I can hear you now. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, what I want to say is we need now more than ever to protect 50% of the entire planet for wildlife, for open space, for clean air, for clean water, clean oceans. And we can get there stepwise by protecting 30% by 2030. And we can do this not just at a national scale, but within each bioregion within our country. And activists are working in other countries, England, Indonesia, Japan, China, Australia, to do the same thing there. Um, it's a, a global campaign and it's one we need to bring about and win soon because I think 50 years from now we're probably not going to be fighting so much about the protection of open spaces because basically everything's either going to be protected or developed. That battle is going to be over uh, in 50 years or so. So now is the time we've got to load up as much as possible on the side of protected lands. It's what we need to have a healthy civilization. It's what we need to stop the mass extinction crisis. 
And so Randy is going to tell us uh, a lot more about uh, what the center is doing specifically uh, to bring that about as a real life campaign, not just a big exciting idea. Yeah, Randy's our public lands director. And so Randy, why is this issue so important right now? Great, thanks Tiara and thanks Karan. And hi folks, thanks for tuning in on, on this Earth Day. Well, I think folks know uh, you've been reading the news, the science reports, our work from the center. We are in the midst of a heartbreaking wildlife extinction crisis. Wildlife populations are crashing around the world. Scientists predict we're gonna lose 1 million species globally unless there is a worldwide movement to take action to protect half the planet and address the climate crisis. We've lost half of our rainforests, two thirds of our wetlands. We've lost 60% of the planet's wildlife since 1970. Let that sink in. That's a tremendous amount of loss in just 50 years, as Kieran was talking, the clock is ticking. And in the US, it's no different. Every 30 seconds, a football field's worth of America's natural areas are disappearing to strip malls, roads, housing developments, pipelines, and other development. We've got to act now. So protecting half the earth for wildlife sounds great for wildlife, but is it going to be bad for humans? Well, wildlife, they're important in their own right and we've done enough damage to them. In fact, the world would be a pretty sad and lonely place if we lost so many of the species we love. But here's the thing, protecting nature, it's one of the most important and efficient things that we can actually do to protect ourselves. Think about it, the drivers of wildlife extinction, it, it's the same thing that's undermining our life support systems. We're talking about pollinators, bees, butterflies that provide our food, water purification, oxygen production from rainforests and disease regulation. If COVID-19 has underscored anything, it is the link between destroying nature and spreading diseases from coming into close contact with wildlife. But we've got this ambitious goal, which as Karan said, it's not just the center, we're fully in the game, it's global. And if we protect half by 2050 and 30% by 2030, we'll be taking a crucial step to Hold the wildlife extinction crisis. I don't know if my screen is frozen. Somebody said my Zoom. Yeah, there you go. And you look good. All right, great. Um, so if we do this, we'll be solving a lot of human problems. We're going to halt the wildlife extinction crisis by protecting the habitat. We will be mitigating the climate crisis. Keeping our forests intact will store and absorb enormous amounts of CO2. Uh, protecting wetlands will slow storm surges in our coastal communities, safeguard our water and air, and ensure that our planet remains livable and wild and wonderful. So we need to protect diversity in order to protect humanity, but how do we get there? What's the solution? Well, it won't be easy. It's an ambitious but doable goal. You know, this crisis, it's entirely of our making. It's, it's the way we've all been living and the corporations that are kind of forcing this behavior on us. Um, our dependence on fossil fuels, uh, Exxon, big plastic companies. We're doing what we can, but we need fundamental change. So here's how we get to 30% by 2030. The good news is we've got some very important building blocks here in the US. So the United States is blessed with a wonderful system of public lands. And the map that's going up now shows our, our public lands. And the US is rather unique. No other country boasts our system of parks, wildlife refuges, uh, high deserts and, and grasslands and national forests. So the legend is sort of cut off on the map here, I think, but if, if folks can see, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people go out and enjoy and recreate on these lands, these are America's public lands. So it's our national forests, it's our, the Bureau of Land Management, our system of deserts and grasslands, refuges and parks. Now, this whole bit of land here is 28% of the US land base. Uh, but as you could see, it's not really distributed well. It's pretty heavy in the West. We're missing a lot of public lands in the East and, and the, the North of the country. But before folks get excited and say, wait, that's 28%, we only have 2% to go to get protected before we get to 2030, a couple of things we need to know. 
The laws that govern our public lands, unfortunately, allow a lot of destructive activities. Logging. Here's a shot of clear cut in the Tongass National Forest, one of the last, you know, biggest intact rainforests uh, in North America, though it's getting heavily fragmented. Uh, logging roads, next slide. We've got 380,000 miles of logging roads on our national forest system. As wonderful as, as our national forests are, they are heavily fragmented. This is harmful to wildlife. The sediment and erosion goes into our streams, harming our fish. Also on public lands, fossil fuel companies can drill and frack. Next slide, please. Here's a shot along the White River in Utah, and this is a giant frack field. Mining is also, next slide please, allowed on public lands. This is Wyoming in the Powder River Basin coal, but there's also huge mining for copper and gold and other minerals. Next slide, livestock grazing, cows. You wouldn't think it, cows are very pervasive in the arid west and every uh, bit of native grass that a cow eats is something that a sage grouse or, or other na uh, native wildlife don't get to eat. You could see the denuded landscape in the background. So while we have a wonderful system of public lands, the laws are such that there's a lot of damage happening. They won't be converted into a strip mall, that's true. But in terms of protecting wildlife and the extinction crisis, we need some fundamental changes. And the same goes for our oceans. Next slide, please. There is, as folks know, a lot of offshore drilling. Here is uh, a picture of the BP Horizon disaster, and it was just the anniversary. And we've got Trump rolling back protections for offshore drilling now. Um, so the oceans are in jeopardy too, and not just from uh, drilling, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, shipping lanes and industrial commercial fishing. Here's a picture of a whale off the coast of California tangled in commercial fishing gear. So we need protections for our oceans too. So now taking a step back, and I know these were hard facts and hard pictures to see, but it's important because we need to understand what kind of changes we need. So out of that 28%, how much of our lands and oceans are actually protected? Well, next slide, please. So here's that same map. And now what this shows is what lands are permanently protected in their natural state and managed for biodiversity. It's 13% of our lands. Mostly this is national parks, wildlife refuges, um, some natural protected areas of, of the state and, and nature preserves. And uh, there is a definition of what protected means and it's an international definition with, with standards. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature defines these protections so we can classify them pretty much. Um, then also in terms of oceans, next slide please. We do have, here's a shot of marine protected areas in yellow. And to orient yourself, you could see uh, over there, Florida and you can see the US. And so the yellow areas are marine protected areas and they can be very important. We've got 26% of the oceans protected. They're not all solid, solid protections like to protect the whales in that picture I showed, but it's a good start. So clearly we've got a ways to go to get to 30%, but there is a path forward. We need stronger protections for our public lands to upgrade more parks, refuges and monuments. And for oceans, we need more marine protected areas. So to end the extinction crisis, we really need to change the management of public lands. And how is the center working for a solution? That's a lot of pressure because you're the public lands director. So, <laughs> Well, that's true, but we've got a great team of warriors behind us and, and so many people at the center work on public lands too. And I must say everyone who's tuning in now, if you've ever signed any of our alerts and and participate in one of our actions, it all helps. So we've got a plan. Um, and of course the center's not alone in this, as Karan said, it, it's global, but also lots of other groups working on it. But we're, we're doing five things. First, every day, day in and day out, we are fighting destructive projects on public land so we don't lose, ha lose habitat. It is no secret, but the occupant in the White House right now is dead set on doing everything he can to extract as many resources as he can from our public lands. So we've had our hands full, but we are gonna fight day in and day out. Now, the next, we need to build a groundswell of political and public support for this ambitious goal of protecting 30% of our lands, 30% of our oceans by 2030. 
We also, and we'll talk about that more in a sec, we also need to build support to, to change the way public lands are managed. Right now, under the guise of multiple use, that's the technical term in the laws that govern public lands, yes, they need to protect wildlife and water, but as you saw, a whole lot of destruction. Frankly, a lot more than that, then protection is going on. We need to flip it on its head. We need to get public lands to be managed for primarily for wildlife, for habitat, and for climate and compatible recreation. A new administration can do this. A new president, fingers crossed, a new administration will have tremendous powers to actually change things administratively to make this happen without going through Congress. So we've got a plan for that. Number four, right now with our public lands, we need to get more of our lands upgraded to higher conservation status. So that's more national monuments, more marine monuments, more national wildlife refuges. Again, a new administration has tremendous power to do this. And so we're already scoping out areas of the country that we know need to get their protection status upgraded. Of course, Congress can create wilderness, which is super great, and also national parks. And we'll go after those too. But should we get a new, when we get a new administration, we're gonna be full on trying to upgrade protections on public lands. Now, you saw the map, it's not quite balanced. We got heavy public lands in the west, but we're really short in the east. And particularly in the southeast, that's where there's a lot of biodiversity still left to be protected. We can acquire more lands. The Land and Water Conservation Fund is one mechanism. If folks are familiar, it's a pot of money uh, that actually comes from fossil fuel revenues, but it's dedicated to land acquisition, federal land acquisition and state and local. And so just before COVID-19 hit, Believe it or not, uh, there was gonna be a bill passed that would permanently appropriate, in other words, money would be available to acquire new lands for protection. Um, hopefully that bill will get across the finish line even in this administration, and we can take advantage of that big pot of money to secure protections and acquire lands that we need. So the center's definitely got a plan. How can our members help? What can the average person do to help? Well, we need, we need everybody out there more than ever. I mean, this has to be, uh, we've got to get people talking about 30 by 30. It's got to become common language. We're just sort of ramping up this campaign. So you ask people on the street, they won't really know what 30 by 30 is. We need to get people understanding it. Talk to your friends, you know, the most respected people. How do you password on an idea? You read the news, but of course you talk to your friends. That's where we get information from. I encourage all of you to go out and talk to your networks about this, um, to build public support, letters to the editor, writing op-eds. There are so many things that you can do and we need to build public support. So uh, Senator Udall and Senator Bennett have introduced a resolution in Congress. It's like a bill, um, 30 by 30. Um, it's a great short document and it lays out, it makes the case for why we need to do this. It's everything we've talked about tonight. There's also a House Companion Resolution too, Representative uh, Deborah Helen from New Mexico. We need to get members of Congress signing on in support of that resolution. The more support we build behind, behind this resolution, and it basically sets out that it is a policy of the United States that we will make a commitment to protect 30% of our lands and 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's making our demands known. So I encourage all of you, that was the action alert Tierra was talking about. When you get her email, please go online and send that letter to a member of Congress. And don't be shy, call them too and email them. And let's keep pushing and let's get hundreds of members of Congress on this resolution. That's the way we're gonna get it done. You know, I, I was thinking about this today COVID-19, if there is a silver lining, it shows we can change our behavior and it shows that the government can mobilize. We just passed a bill for $2 trillion and we need money to make this happen too. The thing about the extinction crisis and climate change, it's kind of like watching a slow moving train wreck. There's never like one minute. It's just happening by a thousand cuts. But by ramping up and declaring this emergency, and it is, it's a climate emergency and an extinction crisis emergency, we can get change too at the highest levels. So look for that action alert, sign on, call your member of Congress, let's ramp it up. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, so back to the whole saving half the earth idea, Kiran, where did this idea come from and what's the center's role in this? Well, the idea, 
really got going about a decade ago uh, when a, a very famous uh, elder statesman of conservation, E.O. Wilson, uh, published a book called Half Earth, and he laid out the case for for doing this um, and why if we have less than half, we're not going to be able to stop the extinction crisis. Um, his book really sort of put this um, on the agenda, but it was it was still like a lot of details to be to be worked out as a very generalized uh, proposal. Um, so then in 2017, um, a group of conservationists and um, scientists uh, led by a former chief scientist of the World Wildlife Fund uh, put out a paper. Uh, I was one of the, the co-authors of the paper with them. And uh oh, you're frozen. Hopefully you'll unfreeze here in a second. On Earth, everyone is frozen. Okay, now you're, now you're back. So, so we mapped out all natural areas on the entire planet, uh, calculated how much of them were actually protected, uh, how many were capable of being protected in the future, um, and how many were just unlikely to be protected due to urban growth and so forth. Um, and so we were able to take every bioregion on Earth and figure out where is it in the process of getting to 50% protection? What are the big areas that could still be protected to move it forward? Uh, and unfortunately, what are some of the bioregions where we're, we're not likely to, to get to that point? So, so that was put out in 2017. And that was the first really big sort of detailed analysis to allow uh, activist groups, people to start to hone in on how to get uh, to this. And then finally, uh, this year, uh, the UN stepped in, in in a big way. So just as the UN has uh, the IPCC, its panel uh, you hear a lot about that um, comes up with climate science um, and is working on an international agreement um, of nations uh, to address climate. It's got a second parallel process been going on for many years um, called the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, the CBD. And it's been around for quite a while trying to protect, um, trying to get nations to agree to protect endangered species and primarily through habitat protection because habitat destruction is the number one cause of uh, species extinction. And this year it came out with a draft new proposal which greatly increased its prior targets which were around 12% of land and water protected to endorse the concept of getting to 30% by 2030 and to 50% by 2050. So it came out with the draft proposal. Uh, you might have seen a lot of media uh, on this a few months ago. Um, and then that's moving toward uh, an uh, international conference currently put on hold due to COVID, uh, but where they bring the nations together and try to hammer out an international treaty to make this happen. So it's really, uh, that, that was a really big step in this idea leaping out of the sort of uh, the science of the universities and the activism of conservation groups into the international governmental realm. Um, and so that will be proceeding. We'll keep working on that. Unfortunately, there's only one major nation on earth that has not signed on to the uh, CBD, Conservation on Biological Diversity, and that is the United States. Uh, Bill Clinton tried to uh, sign the U.S. onto it. He was overruled by uh, the Senate at that time, which was uh, uh, 
dominated by Republicans. And so that will be a very, very important next step for the next president is to get the U.S. on board with the entire international community and not be a, a, a lone, a lonely holdout. And, and we shouldn't be because the U.S. has historically led the world in land preservation, in protecting land for the public and for wildlife. The U.S. has, has been a leader in that for well over 100 years. And so we should not be sitting on the sidelines as the entire world comes together uh, to pass a treaty to make this happen. So when you say protected land, what do you mean? How do you define protected? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a critical aspect of, of um, uh, all of this because as, as Randy made clear, not all of our public lands are protected. A lot of it's logged. Some units are entirely devoted to, to recreation. Recreation's fine, but that's not a protected area as far as wildlife goes. So there is a international body, the IUCN, which come up with a whole taxonomy of protection from high to low. And um, to qualify as, as the 50% of the earth that we need, um, lands have to meet that's uh, the top tiers of protection. Now, it doesn't mean, however, that these are all wildernesses or national parks. Uh, there's not enough land out there, not enough wild land, not enough uninhabited land out there to get anywhere near 50% if you think that's all gonna be in new parks and wilderness areas. That's not how it's gonna happen. There certainly are new parks and wilderness areas to be had, we need those. Uh, but a lot of this land is gonna be land that people live up, that people use, um, but people can live on and they can use land in a way that doesn't destroy the habitat qualities. There are wolves and bears and jaguars and trout and monarch butterflies need. Um, a good portion of that land, uh, especially in um, South America and Africa, uh, is uh, owned and lived on by indigenous peoples. Uh, indigenous peoples have, have been uh, setting up protections on their own lands uh, for many years now, trying to fight off um, incursions into their land by loggers, miners, uh, ranchers, land thieves. Uh, there's battles going on all over the world with corporations trying to um, seize indigenous lands. Um, and so part of the criteria explicitly talks about, you know, what indigenous people are doing to protect their lands and why that would qualify as protected areas um, under this scheme. Um, and those tribes, those indigenous groups, feel like this will help them to protect their lands from incursion. Um, and it's critical. Like we've seen right now um, in um, Brazil, a huge political turnaround um, and the Bolsonaro uh, essentially declaring war on indigenous people, saying he's not gonna protect uh, are not going to respect and enforce the laws that are set up to protect those lands, to keep out loggers and miners, encouraging them to go in there. People are getting killed. Um, and so it makes you really realize when you see what uh, Bolsonaro is doing there, sort of just this overt uh, racism that things that progress that we think is consistent that's been happening for decades can get reversed quickly if the wrong leader is in place. And that's why we need to get these things enshrined in law as much as possible so they're not at the whims of any particular political leader. And I also wanna uh, point out a, a good chunk of these lands also will probably be uh, state and county land. It won't all be federal. There's a lot of potential for federal. The feds have a lot of money. 
uh, the feds generally are less susceptible to local political corporate pressure. Uh, that's why our best lands are in the federal realm. But nonetheless, uh, a lot of states have large, well-protected state land systems, state parks. Um, and many counties do as well. Los Angeles County has the Santa Monica Mountains north of LA. It's the largest urban park in the entire world. Uh, here in Tucson, Pima County set up uh, its uh, saguaro park in 1911. And it's a huge expanse of undeveloped, completely protected land right at the edge of the urban boundary of the city of Tucson. So cities and counties, uh, rather counties and states, I think will also play a big role in this. And um, it'll be greatly in their interest there. They're struggling now all over, especially in the East, to protect open spaces for people. I mean, there's no, there's no city, county or state that thinks, wow, we made a mistake. We protected too much land 50 years ago. Wow, what an error. Like, no, no one thinks they've ever protected too much land. What they say is, oh my God, I wish we had protected that 50 years ago because now that lake is completely polluted. Now there's no access of people to the ocean. Um, so, so there'll be a lot of activity on, on the state and county front as well. So if you're calling for half Earth to be protected, what happens to the other half? Are you saying go develop half the Earth? Well, I'll, and you, you can jump in too. Uh, no, no. Um, it's that, um, for example, you know, there'll still be logging going on, right? That allow people build houses out of out of wood, right? So that'll still be happening in that other 50%. But it doesn't mean we're going to say, okay, go clear cut it, do what you want, cut down all the old growth trees, right? We're still going to say, well, wait a minute, this needs to be sustainable. This needs to be done, right? This needs to be uh, protected. Um, and similarly, you know, a lot of our water is going to flow off the other 50% that, that we use. Uh, in our cities and towns, right? So you can't just give up on that and let it be polluted. Um, and I should also note that a good chunk of that other 50% uh, are places like the Antarctic um, and the Arctic. Um, it's gonna be places where we get some extremely, extremely dry uh, deserts like the Sahara. And so, so a lot of that are not places that um, are intensely used, intensely developed anyways, uh, because they're, they're so harsh. Um, so it, it's a holistic, it's not like we're gonna give up half the earth, um, but we're certainly gonna ensure on one half of it, the top priority is making sure wild plants and animals can survive, that, that there's a place for the other earthlings and if 50 percent of the planet is dominated by one species it's not unreasonable to say that the other 50 percent should be for the use of the other 13 million species i was actually going to give you a hard time about that because humans are one species and there's like three to 100 million species let's go with 13 because you just said that so why isn't our share one thirteenth millionth why do we get half <laughs> Well, it's because, you know, we're, we're starting from where we are today because there's nowhere else to start from, right? Um, and no one is going to bulldoze down New York City and return it to uh, coastal grassland. It's just not happening. Uh, and if you did, you'd lose a lot of, like, amazing libraries and opera houses and museums and cool restaurants, you know? So, um, so the reality is humans, there, there's seven plus, seven plus billion of us now. Uh, we do want to get the population level down, but that's where we are. And it's, it's, it's going to keep increasing for the foreseeable future. 
Um, and that's the reality that we got to work around. Uh, but luckily, we can, with 50% of the earth, instead of 99.9% .9 of it, with 50%, that's enough to end this incredibly heartbreaking extinction crisis that we're in. Um, so it's a compromise, but I think it's one that will work and it's one that we can actually achieve. And within that 50%, it seems like we're gonna have to prioritize places with high biodiversity. It can't just be any 50%, it's gotta be places that support a lot yeah, of plants that, and animals. That is a super important issue. And if you look, you know, we've been setting up national parks uh, since eight, 1872, right? Yellowstone was the very first one. Uh, first wilderness area was in 1924 uh, in the Gila, but they really got going uh, in, in 1964. Now, when these first parks and wilderness areas were set up, the priority uh, was these big, grand, scenic uh, vistas. And it's tons and tons and tons of rock and ice. Extremely dramatic, but it's not the most important wildlife areas. There's lower elevation, warmer areas, less dramatic. Uh, that's where you find more wildlife. Uh, and these are the important areas to get. And so, so historically, we, we've certainly biased our land protection efforts toward lands that are both you know visually stunning and two uh politically acceptable all right because to to go in and say okay we're going to protect all the old growth forest rainforest on the west coast of the united states and in oregon and washington that would have been a great move but you can imagine the political opposition to that at the time we're still working on it. <laughs> Randy's still working on it. Um, so the point is, you know, the, the, these lands were created. They were all created through political processes and bills were passed and votes were taken and deals were made. And that led to some of the most economically valuable lands being left out. So going forward, it's critical that we look at this through a lens of what is biologically, ecologically important to wildlife, not just what's scenically beautiful. And look at it through the lens to say, we're not gonna avoid the difficult political battles over a commercially valuable land. We need that land, the wildlife need that land. We have to fight that battle and we've got to win it. So, and I think that's especially where the center can, um, really contribute to this because we have that laser focus on endangered species and wildlife. We've got the scientific ability to map out the corridors and figure out where we need to be. And frankly, we've got the, uh, the courage and the daring to push for more, to push for it all and say, that's what we need here. Um, not just the low hanging fruit. We're not gonna get there if we just get the low hanging fruit. So we've got more than 500 people on and questions are pouring in. If we don't get to all your questions tonight, you can email them to me or find me on Slack tomorrow on the Endangered Species Mobilized for the Wild channel. Um, lots of questions are coming in, but let's get to those now. So first one, elephant in the room, if Trump is reelected, can we still accomplish this goal? I could take the first crack at that. Okay. Uh, well, let's a hope that's not the case, but if it is, look, it, it's going to be a lot harder. It, it's no secret that, that he does not have the same uh, sensibilities as we do to protect uh, and end the extinction or the climate crisis, but um, things can still happen. Last year, uh, a bill passed that did establish new wilderness, wild and scenic rivers. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, we could expect Trump, really because he's trying to protect two Republican senators because people demanded that they want the Land and Water Conservation Fund fully funded. So things can happen under Trump. 
Where, what we'll do if that happens, though, is we will look, well, first of all, we still need to push for 30 by 30 at the federal level. We still need to do that. We need to make these demands known, but we can also turn on more attention, as Karan was talking about, to the county and state level. Because there's a lot of land, there's a lot of very important land, that's where we get a lot of wildlife quarters. So all is not lost. Um, we need to push at the federal level, but also turn our attention to the state and county level as well. We have got tons of questions to get to. Um, how do we get more protected lands in the east? The map that you put up was pretty skewed to the west. It was. Uh, there, um, well, a couple of things. So again, state and county levels. There is a, a resolution, a 30 by 30 resolution, and I hope everybody who's watching goes online afterwards and, and reads the federal resolution, the, the North Carolina one reads the same. There's a resolution in the state legislature that's been introduced, and there's no reason why we can't do that in other um, states in the Southeast as well. Um, the other thing we can do on a federal level is to acquire land. Um, and create new refuges. That, again, going back to Land and Water Conservation Fund, that is a big pot of money. Land can be acquired and protected. So uh, those are two ways to go about it. So if folks here on this call have contacts at their state legislators, legislature, and you can contact here tomorrow, we'd like to see other states pick up the mantle of 30 by 30 and get bills introduced to keep pushing. What about on the international front? What's happening internationally? Oh, enormous things are happening um, internationally. And I, I had mentioned that the, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity is now proceeding and uh, through the UN, and it, it will be pushing for an uh, international treaty um, of all 160 nations or so to, to agree to protect their lands at this level. And so there will be a ton and a ton of activism and lobbying and shouting and yelling around this um, and trying to get nations to sign on. Um, and just as activist groups were very, very involved in the international negotiations, um, they're gonna be involved in this. So, so that'll be happening at that level um, uh, elsewhere, it's interesting, South America in the last uh, 15 years or so has been establishing huge national parks. Uh, they've protected way more uh, acres per year on average than, than North America because uh, there's been a real big push of uh, activists and indigenous people in South America to make that happen. So. So a lot of work being done down there. Uh, and then Europe is really interesting. Um, Europe's got a lot of, um, well, it's got way fewer national parks in the US, but the parks that it does have, they're almost all privately owned. You see a national park on the map, you know, you drive out there, you think it's gonna be Yellowstone. Uh, and in fact, it's completely privately owned. Uh, you can go hiking out there, but you can't camp can't have a fire. Um, and a lot of it is still used uh, for livestock raising. So now there's a growing uh, movement in Europe to start to have their federal governments uh, purchase big open spaces and have federal, big federal protected lands uh, more similar to what the US is doing. So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, and then finally, there's a real intersection here with climate because um, uh, habitat destruction, especially logging, is a major cause of global warming. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, about 40% of all the global warming we've done historically uh, as humans has come from destroying habitat turning up, up the soils. So there's a lot of work being done uh, through the lens of climate to ensure uh, greater protection for existing habitats and also to restore areas because when you restore trees, uh, those lands are able to absorb carbon at a greater level. So, uh, so the whole climate movement uh, internationally uh, is very active in, in trying to reach these goals as well. 
Here's a question about indigenous sovereignty. How is the center working with indigenous people with rightful claims on land and for which they would be better stewards? Well, we've got, you know, at any given point, um, the center's probably got 40, 50 different campaigns going on um, with indigenous uh, nations or indigenous activists um, all over the country and a few internationally. And a good amount of that work focus is on protecting lands which are not under tribal ownership now, are not part of the reservation systems. And they either used to be and the reservation was shrunk or it never got put in the reservation in, in the first place. But so these are public lands, sometimes private lands, uh, that are the traditional lands of indigenous groups all over the country, places like say Oak Flat here in um, Arizona, that's very, very important to the San Carlos Apache people, but it's not on their reservation. Uh, and the US government, the US Forest Service is um, giving it away to, to a mining corporation. So, so a lot of our work involves trying to protect public lands because these are lands that are, are of sacred importance to indigenous tribes and they're being destroyed because the tribe has no control over them. And we've also been um, pushing and we were hoping to get a actually a presidential executive order uh, guaranteeing this, uh, pushing for uh, tribes to co-manage important cultural areas on federal public lands and making it illegal uh, for federal land managers to destroy the sacred areas on those lands. So, so there's a lot that we're doing, um, a lot more than can be done. And I think we're seeing a real uptick generally, a real big uptick in um, opposition movements and activism by the tribes uh, to demand more protected areas and demand that their voice be heard on these lands. And so it was a coalition of tribes that were at the forefront, for example, of getting the Bears Ears National Monument created. Historically, most national monuments have been created through pressure and coalitions from environmental groups. Uh, and in this case, it was the tribes that um, got uh, the Obama administration to do Bears Ears. And when uh, Trump has come in and tried to radically shrink that, uh, the tribes have been at the forefront of, of litigating to to stop it. And, and we've seen similar really, really big moves uh, by the Blackfeet uh, in Montana, for example, to protect huge plots of land, public land for mining up there. So we're in a real um, upswing in, in activism from the tribes demanding uh, a right to help determine the future and, and manage these public lands. We've got a question for Randy. How do forest plans play into protecting half the earth? Uh, well, they could play a lot. Um, the problem is the current rules that were revised in 2012, uh, which guide forest plans. For folks on the phone, a forest plan, it's like a big general plan for each national forest that lasts like 20 years. And unfortunately, it was under the Obama administration, but they are weakened significantly. And so if, if you're in the hands of a, of a good forest supervisor, we can see protections. Um, uh, more roadless areas that weren't swept up in the first dedicated wild and scenic rivers, not Congress has to do that, but they can uh, designate it eligible for wild and scenic. We can also see them put aside wilderness study areas. So they could be used for good, but I am, um, it's very frustrating right now because unfortunately that is not what's happening on a national forest system. Trump put out an executive order um, at the end of 2018, which basically said ramp up the board feet 
let's go log in the name of, you know, fire and everything. And so uh, it's, it's a struggle right now. But if folks want to talk about that more, you can get my email address on our website and I'd be happy to talk to you. We well, and you know, the, the weakness of forest plans and how they've got increasingly weak over the last uh, decade or so is really a perfect example of why we need to pass 30 by 30 legislation. We need to up our game. Uh, as activists, we've been involved in, in um, planning processes for forest plans and litigating and so forth for 30 years and, and we'll continue to do so. We need to, but none of that is gonna get us to 30. 30. Uh, at best, that helps us hold the line on some important habitat destruction, so we will do it. But, but most of our existing systems of planning is simply inadequate to ever get us to the point of stopping the wildlife extinction crisis. And we've got to up our game, we've got to move it to a whole new level while we keep fighting the old important battles. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Randy and Karen, and thank you all of you at home for joining us today. You can take action on this issue right now by going to our main webpage, centerforbiologicaldiversity.org, and going to current action alerts, which is under action on the top left. And we've created an alert called, it's time to protect 30% of the US by 2030. And you can use that to send letters to your representatives asking them to protect 30% of the US by 2030. We're not gonna get to the rest of your questions, but I'll be on Slack tomorrow from noon to one, or you can email me or Randy your questions. Next week, the Saving Life on Earth webinar is going back to Thursday at 4 p.m. And we're gonna talk about grizzly bears and wolverines with Noah Greenwald, our Endangered Species Program Director, and Andrea Zaccardi, a senior attorney in our Northern Rockies office. So send me your questions and thank you so much for joining us and happy Earth Day. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Maybe we have.